Hi, welcome to Fundamentals Friday. Today we're going to answer the question, why do you use multiple bypass capacitors? You've probably seen this in many uh, circuits that you've got your chip here, you've got your power, power rail, and you might have more than one bypass capacitor just on that one chip or even just that one power rail on a chip that might have multiple uh, power rails. For example, it's not that uncommon to find like a one microfarad cap, a 100 nanofarad cap, a 10 nanofarad cap, or one nanofarad cap. You can have two, three, or four caps in parallel. Why? What's going on here? Hmm, let's answer it. Now I actually covered this very briefly back in episode 33, back when I was in the old lab, but it was only like a minute or two explanation. So I thought we'd go more in depth here. And I've actually done a, uh, not a video not that long ago on why you would use multiple electrolytic capacitors in parallel. And I came up with a huge list of nine different reasons why you would actually put more than one electrolytic capacitor in parallel. So click here if you haven't seen that video, it goes in depth. And and it does some uh, thermal testing as well to actually prove it. Now, we're not talking about electrolytic capacitors here. This is a different scenario. We're talking about different value capacitors for, uh, in particular, chip bypassing. Now, there are very good technical reasons why you would actually want to put multiple capacitors for bypassing applications in parallel, in particular, different values and different types of capacitors. But before we answer that, we have to actually look at what is bypassing. Now, in an ideal world, you wouldn't actually need bypassing. It'd be completely pointless. Because let's take a look at a chip like this, okay? It does whatever this chip happens to do. We've got a battery or a power supply here. It doesn't really matter. And we've got a load, so it's uh, consuming power inside the chip to do various uh, switching and things like that. And that's what I've shown here with these two uh, MOSFETs in there. Let's assume it's a CMOS chip doesn't matter. Um, and so it's doing internal switching, it's doing all its business, and we've got a like a totem pole output, it's driving loads, it's driving lines, it's doing whatever chips normally do. Now, let's assume that we had a 5 volt supply here, let's go old school, none of this 3.3 volt rubbish, um, and this 5 volts, in an ideal circuit, you're going to get 5 volts directly on the pin of this chip in here because there's no internal resistance in the power supply, there's no internal resistance in the battery, whatever you happen to be using, there's no internal, uh, there's no resistance on the PCB traces that you're using, there's no inductance, there's no nothing. It's just an ideal world and our ideal chip. Everything's hunky-dory. You don't need bypass capacitors and every other chip on your PCB as well. It's also going to get exactly five volts on that pin. It never moves, it's rock solid. So you don't need any bypassing in an ideal world. Unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world. In the real world, unfortunately, everything has resistance, everything has inductance, everything has capacitance. All these parasitic elements. And uh, take your power supply, for example. It's, you can't get a perfect power supply. It's going to have some uh, equivalent series resistance, a, seri a resistor in series with it. Your PCB traces going from your power supply, like your power supply input connector on your board, for example, uh, to your chip or to multiple chips. The PCB traces, they're going to have resistance resistance. They're going to have inductance. Every piece of wire has inductance, no matter how small. It's going to have capacitance down to ground, but we won't look at that in this case. So what's going to happen if we have no bypass capacitor on our VCC power pin of our chip? Our 5 volts, if, if the chip is doing nothing and it's just static, okay, yes, we will get a straight, we will get just our 5 volt line on there, but the chip is switching, it's doing stuff. There's lots of capacitance inside the chip, uh, capacitance takes uh, switching currents and things like that, so you're getting all these pulses of current. So our waveform is not going to be straight like this on our VCC pin, it's going to, it might jump up and down like this depending on the switching inside that thing. And then we've got our load as well, our load is powered through the VCC pin, through that uh, top uh, transistor up there to actually drive the load, whether or not it's sinking current or sourcing current. So that's going to contribute as well. And hey, depending on the value of these traces here, it can you can actually get significant dips and it can drop below the operating voltage of the chip and start causing strange weird things. This is sort of like a gross generalization, but 
This is what sort of thing can happen if you've got no local bypassing on your chip. But one of the big problems is not so much uh, the resistance of the traces, it's more to do with the inductance of the traces, especially the higher frequency your chips get. Even, you know, high frequency can be a megahertz or so. Look at an old, you know, computer board from the 1970s or 80s, you know, with hundreds of chips on them. They've all got a bypass cap next to each particular chip because of the inductance of all the power traces going there. And remember, we won't go into details, but remember an inductor actually resists change in current. So if your chip or your load suddenly decides it needs to switch, your inductor goes, oh no, I can't change that quickly. I, I can't do it. So you're going to get these huge dips and problems and all sorts of stuff. So it all just becomes really nasty and your 5 volt supply for your chip, your power supply, is not the solid power supply you're expecting. So that's why we add in a bypass capacitor in here like this, right at as close as possible to the pin of the chip. Because why does it have to be as close as possible? Because you're trying to avoid the inductance in the line here and every trace has inductance. So the further away you put your bypass capacitor from the chip, the greater the inductance and then causes all sorts of problems when your chip starts to switch at high frequencies. So the goal of uh, when you're bypassing is to uh, try and produce a low impedance, low inductive uh, supply element. Remember, capacitors store charge. So they charge up and then when your chip switches suddenly and it requires a gulp of current, it comes from the capacitor instead of way, way back on the other side of your PCB, which has all these long inductances in series and all sorts of stuff. It comes directly from the local capacitor. So it minimizes the amount of duct inductance and resistance in series with it. So that bypass capacitor can supply that little gulp of current that your chip suddenly needs without being affected by the rest of your PCB layout and all the other parasites. So let's take a quick look at what actually happens to an output pin here, for example, which is really important because it's driving other uh, chips as well as part of your system. So if you get issues on that uh, output signal, it can cause corruption. The other chip may not read it properly, all sorts of issues like that. And you may have actually seen this. Uh, let's take a look. So what we've drawn is another waveform like this in, of course, the ideal world. Your output will switch from zero volts up to five volts here. It'll be absolutely perfect. There'll be no re in, there'll be no overshoot, no undershoot, nothing. But of course, I use those keywords there, overshoot and undershoot and ring in. What they're caused by is the inductance in the power supply here. Even if you've got local uh, bypassing, bypass capacitors here, there's going to be a little bit of inductance in the trace because you can't put it right on the pins. There's going to be a little bit inside the chip with the bonding wires, for example, that actually, you know, because your die is like inside this, they've got to have the little bonding wire which goes over inside the chip. That's got a little bit of uh, inductance and all that can actually lead to ringing on your signal like this and you've probably seen that uh, before and then you can get some undershoot down here like this and causes issues like this. It's all to do with bypassing and the higher frequency uh, content you've got, um, the more this becomes a problem. And I'm not just talking about the signal frequency itself. It could be, you know, one, one kilohertz. A one kilohertz square wave, for example, not high frequency as you would measure it on a frequency counter. But remember that a change in digital signal like this, it's all it's not to do with the fundamental frequency, the time difference between here and here, it's to do with how fast the rising and falling edges are. The faster the edge, you know, if it's a really slow edge like that, it's going to have low frequency content. If it's a super duper fast uh, edge that switches in a nanosecond or something like that, then it's going to have really high frequency content. That's your basic Fourier um, theory and all that sort of stuff. So even a one kilohertz signal can actually have this real high frequency broadband content in there that causes all this ringing. And when you've got a complex system with many chips and everything else, well, it can cause a major problem. Even within, if you've only got a single chip solution like this, if you don't bypass the caps and it's not getting clean power, then 
internally to the chip, you're still going to get all this effective ringing and things like that due to the bonding wire inductance, your PCB trace inductance and everything, your ground inductance here. It's not just your power line up here. You're going to have some inductance in here. You're going to have some inductance down here like this. So that's why it's important to have your bypass cap directly on the pins of the chip as close as physically possible. And of course, if you actually probe your power supply, you'll actually see this sort of stuff happening here. Okay, you'll get your you might have your five volts, but then you'll see that eh, the ringing on the power supply eh, like that. So you'll get all these little. You'll see that if you actually probe correctly. There's high frequency probing techniques you need to use and everything else. But if you probe that, you can actually start seeing the switching on there and the. If you have uh, no bypassing or not very effective bypassing, your ringing can be very big and cause all sorts of problems. So I know what you're saying, Dave, that's all great, but why not just whack one big bypass capacitor on there that can handle the most amount of current that this thing is going to, pulse current that this uh, switching chip in the system is going to take? Why do you need to have multiple different values and different types of capacitors on there. Aha, trap for young players. This is where we have to get into uh, what a capacitor actually does and its impedance versus frequency. Well, let's go. So in a real capacitor, which I've shown in the previous video on electrolytic capacitors, if you maybe want a bit more detail, it's not just a capacitor. Inside a capacitor, here it is. A real capacitor has an equivalent series resistance, which you might be familiar with, the ESR, which is a constant resistance uh, value essentially in series with the actual capacitor itself. But crucially, also inside a capacitor is a little tiny bit of inductance as well, lead inductance plus uh, construction uh, inductance and various things. And that's called the ESL, the equivalent series inductance. So it's far from a just an ideal capacitor. It's an RLC circuit. What happens with RLC circuits? Well, you can get resonances and you can get all sorts of funny things happening. And as you should know from your basic component theory for capacitors and inductors, they actually have an impedance or what's called a reactance or capacitive reactance and inductive reactance at a certain frequency. They effectively have like an AC resistance, so to speak. And this is these are the standard formulas for your capacitive reactance and your inductive reactance. And they change with frequency. Capacity is uh, inverse with relation to frequency and the inductive uh, reactance goes up with frequency. And we're going to have a total impedance for the capacitor. So a total AC resistance of the capacitor is actually going to be the ESR, which is that uh, constant fixed value in there plus the impedance of the capacitor at whatever frequency you're talking about plus the impedance of the inductor at whatever frequency you're talking about. So if we go over here and have a look at this graph here, we've got uh, the impedance of the capacitor, the bypass capacitor, it's in ohms of course, so the impedance in ohms versus the frequency here. And you get this for a real bypass capacitor, well, a real capacitor, we just happen to be using it in a bypass situation, a real capacitor is going to have a response curve something like this. And this is sort of like an industry standard way to show it. It is not actually a straight line like that because, um, of course, a capacitor will actually have infinite impedance at down at DC here, so it'll taper up like this. Now, if we didn't, if this capacitor didn't have any inductance in it at all, of course, this line would not be here, and you'd just get a slope going down like that, which changes with frequency, and you can plot that yourself. Put the formula into Excel, and you can do it yourself. It's standard basic component theory, but as I said, crucially, that little inductor in there, it's tiny. It could be like Pico Henry's or something like that. But at a particular frequency, it's going to start to matter. Now, uh, the capacitive reactance operates like this, but at some particular frequency here, which is the resonant frequency of this RLC circuit uh, using your standard resonance formula, that's where the capacitive reactance and the inductive reactance are equal. And that is going to be the resonance point. At that point, then the impedance of the reactance of the inductor starts to dominate instead of the impedance of the capacitor. So hence why it reverses and the resistance starts to go back up. 
And that's a very undesirable thing to happen. You don't want this thing to go back up at higher frequencies. You want it to be down like this. Why? Because as we talked about before, about the series, effectively the series resistance, the series impedance, you want the energy to come directly from the capacitor with no effect whatsoever, with no impedance in the path, no inductance in the path. But when you start adding this real inductance, either inside the capacitor itself or outside of the capacitor with your PCB tracers, your in, inside the chip with the little bonding wires, everything else, then this can be a real problem. Your impedance starts to rise and your bypass capacitor isn't acting like a good bypass capacitor anymore at these higher frequencies. And of course, it's at these higher frequencies in modern devices, say for an FPGA, for example, which take hu you know, have huge densities in them, huge amount of switching, huge amount of logic, and uh, multiple rails, and they take huge amounts of current and everything else, and they operate at extremely high frequencies, like you know, hundreds of megahertz. They can switch at hundreds of megahertz, but the edges are even uh, faster, and you can get uh, frequency components into the gigahertz range uh, fairly easily. And if your reactance of your bypass, the impedance of your bypass capacitor starts to rise at these really high frequencies up here at hundreds of megahertz or a gig or whatever, then you're gonna be in serious trouble. Your bypass capacitor may as well not even be there at these higher frequencies because yeah, the capacitance is still there. It's still got, you know, one microfarad or whatever it is, a lot of capacity. You can have a lot of energy stored in that one microfarad capacitor but it's no good, it can't get into the chip if there's this massive series impedance in series with the capacitor. It, it just can't deliver the energy when, that, um, when your IC actually requires it. Give me a big pulse of energy. No, can't do it. Now I think I mentioned before that not only do you have different values here, but you have different packages as well because the package actually makes a difference. As a general rule of thumb, the smaller your package gets, the lower inductance it's going to have, the lower uh, internal inductance here. So it, let's assume that this one is a um, 0603, for example, uh, you know, a SMD package. Then if you've got an 0805, it's going to have a look something like that. It's going to have a higher value. So that'd be, that could be 0805. And then you could have an, you guessed it, 0402 package looking something like that. They're actually going to have different values for the different packages. So it's actually better for higher frequency stuff to use the smaller packages. But of course the big question is why do they use different values? Well different values have remarkably different frequency characteristics as you'd expect. The bigger uh, value capacitors, in this case say one microfarad uh, for example, is going to have a resonant point at a much lower frequency. So it's going to cover uh, the lower frequency range is going to have a lower impedance at a lower frequency. Once again, it's not this V shape, it's, you know, it's going to be something like this, right? So it's going to actually cover a much broader range at a lower frequency uh, right down here, but yeah, work with me, okay? And then you're going to have different values for assuming like this, all the same package, for example, a uh, 100N uh, is going to be high in frequency and then a 10N again and then a 1 nanofarad and then a 100 puff if you want to is going to be much lower. So what you get and the answer to the question, why do you use multiple bypass capacitors? It's so you get the lowest impedance across the largest frequency range possible. So if you've got all three of these values in here, your final curve is going to look like this. Ta-da! So you've got a much broader, lower impedance, so you've got a more effective bypass capacitance over a bigger frequency range. And that's why you do it. So there you have it. That was a bit longer explanation than what I intended. What was it, 20 minutes or something? To explain how bypassing works and why you use multiple bypass capacitors. I could have just jumped straight to this and said, this is why, which is what I did back in episode uh, 33 or whatever, but eh, there's good background information there to explain exactly what's happening here. So I thought, I hope you found that interesting, but hey, I think we might be able to reproduce this on the bench and actually show you. Could be a little bit tricky, but eh, let's give it a go.
Now, ideally to measure this, uh, we would use a network analyzer, big expensive bit of kit, which I don't actually have here in the lab. I need to get myself one. But hey, we can use our red pataya here, which you've uh, seen in a previous video. And um, I've, I'm now powering it from an external uh, plug pack, two amp uh, plug pack, by the way, uh, via the USB, um, which seems to have solved the uh, rebooting issues I was getting before, even though before in the previous video I was actually powering it from a USB 3.0 port which is supposed to be capable of supplying two amps but nah, I don't know. Anyway, um, so it's working a bit more reliably now but I'm still having a few issues with the uh, uh, impedance analyzer app which we're going to use today. So we're going to use uh, three channels here and here's a diagram of how it's actually hooked up. We've basically got a 10 ohm uh, shunt resistor in there and then the device under test. Now, the reason I'm getting this convoluted arrangement here with the uh, bit of Vera board and the wires and everything else is that you're probing in this sort of thing and your wiring, test cabling, is actually quite critical. If I actually ran coaxes off here and stuff, we'd find that we'd be getting all sorts of issues um, in our impedance plot the higher up in frequency we go. So yeah, um, often just dangling wires like that can be better. So I'm converting my SMA to BNC, then I'm converting BNC to uh, banana, um, a binding post here. So I can just hook that up and should be right. It, it's a little bit, you know, it's a bit crude, but hey, we should be able to show the concept at least. Now the good thing about the Vero board here is that um, it has two convenient strips like this that allow us to put multiple capacitors in parallel. So I've got a cap in here. I've just been uh, testing the thing to make sure it all works. And we've got our 10 ohm shunt resistor there. So we can just put as many caps in here as we want. But with something like this, um, we're dealing with, you know, high frequency. We're going to go up to 60 megahertz today, uh, sweep it all the way up to that frequency. So uh, what we want to do first is actually replace the capacitor with a shunt resistor in there because we've got a 10 ohm, sorry, a, we've got a 10 ohm shunt resistor, replace the capacitor with a resistor so that we can actually check to see our frequency response, response is flat and that we're not getting any uh, weird effects caused by uh, cabling all the uh, test setup. So just like we discussed, what we want to get is an impedance versus frequency graph. So uh, basically anything that goes up to you know, tens of megahertz, should we should be able to see something like this. This thing's 125 meg samples per second. You know, analog bandwidth, 50, 60 megahertz, something like that. That'll be good enough to see various uh, capacitors in parallel, hopefully. Now you'll have to forgive me for not doing this uh, live, so to speak, but not only does it save time, but trust me, I spent a lot of time dicking around with this thing, actually trying to get a result because the uh, test setup is actually quite crude, had a lot of issues with the uh, Red Patea, um software and things like that. And uh, the uh, test fixture, with, even with uh, you know the short wires that I'm using, the uh, BNCs make a difference, the adapters, all that sort of stuff, all comes into play. So, you know, I didn't really engineer a proper setup for this. So I was actually lucky to actually get a usable result um, out of this, but I should be able to show you something here. So what we've got here is an impedance response graph, uh, just like we saw on the whiteboard there, impedance in uh, ohms versus frequency there. In this case, we're sweeping from 100 kilohertz up to 60 megahertz on a logarithmic uh, axis there. I tried to set it to start at a higher uh, frequency, but I, it just wouldn't let me. I'm not sure what's wrong with the app. Anyway, um, you can see that started off at, uh, at 100 kilohertz there and right down to DC, of course. It started off as a nice, perfect 10 ohms, exactly what you'd expect. So that just verifies that the system's working. But of course, now the parasitics of our test setup come into this and you can start to see it around about 2 megahertz there or so. You know, it starts to roll off and, you know, it's usable up to, say, you know, 20 megahertz might be usable. Um, um, it's down to measuring, you know, seven and a half ohms or something like that. You know, good enough for ballpark. But at the higher frequencies, of course, then it becomes, you know, <laughs> all the parasitics of the Vera board and everything test fixture come into play. And you can see a bit of noise right at the high frequency. That's because um, there's not much uh, signal to noise ratio there. But in this case, that inaccuracy uh, at the, you know, greater than 20 megahertz range isn't that bad because some of the uh, impedances, as you'll see, actually go up to, you know, hundreds of ohms and things like that. So, you know, it's, it's kind of usable. So I'll sweep it to 60 megahertz, but just keep that in mind that, yeah, it's a little bit off up there. 
And I'll start out by showing you some large value capacitors. This is a 10 microfarad 1206 package ceramic uh, capacitor. Very typical uh, large value bypass cap. And as you can see, it does have that characteristic V-shaped response. As I said before, quite you know much broader than what we saw on the whiteboard, but it's there. You can see there's a resonant point about one megahertz there, and then it tapers back up. Now, here's a 10 microfarad uh, tantalum capacitor, and you can see it's actually uh, higher in value. It goes up to like 1.75 ohms at, you know, 60 megahertz or something like that but you can see it's got a similar shape similar sort of um, resonant frequency around 1.5 megahertz and now this is a uh, just as a curveball 47 microfarad electrolytic capacity you can see it resonates about uh, you know 8 9 megahertz or something tapers back up and obviously that big tail down at the end is due to some parasitics on the uh, vera board now here's a very typical 100 nanofarad uh, 0805 bypass capacitor you'll find in practically every product. And you'll see notice that the uh, impedance scale has now gone up. It's auto scaling in this Red Patea software. It was a little bit annoying that I couldn't actually manually uh, scale the thing to see the data. But uh, it's changed significantly. We're talking about hundreds of millions before. But now down at 100 kilohertz, we're talking like up over 15 ohms. Quite large value. No good for low frequencies. And you'll notice that the resonant point is now up to you know around about five or six megahertz so higher than it was with that larger value capacitance and now we'll take a look at a um, a 10 nanofarad ceramic capacitor same 0805 uh, package but you'll notice that the y scale has changed even again by an order of magnitude down at 100 kilohertz it, it's up, up over 150 ohms or thereabouts 10 times more than what it was before and you'll notice that the now the resonant uh, frequency is right up near 40 50 megahertz or something like that. In fact, this uh, test setup isn't good enough because we're talking about, you know, much higher uh, frequencies here. So, but as you can see, they are actually quite broadband, you know, tens of megahertz um, for these values, like, you know, quite low impedance. Now, if we actually combine a 10 microfarad ceramic with a 100 n ceramic and a 10 n ceramic, you can see that we have look that rise around about 8 megahertz there. So it, very similar to uh, uh, the combined peak response we got on the whiteboard. Now here's an interesting little trap for young players which we didn't discuss before but what happens in reality. Now you can see on the left hand side the same graph we had before of the combined uh, 10 microfarads plus the 100 N there and you'll notice the big lump in there um, in the middle uh, they're at around about um, 8 megahertz or so. Now this is actually undesirable because look at the one on the right as we saw uh, way before this is just the 10 microfarad cap on its own. And you'll notice the y-axis are very similar. It's actually a better result just to have the 10 microfarad capacitor there. In this particular case, with this partic these particular values on this particular Vera board with all its particular uh, parasitics and everything and the values and, and the whole and the test setup and the whole works, it can actually be detrimental in some cases to... Uh, put capacitors in parallel. You can form these resonant peaks there and sometimes it might uh, interact with your hardware in ways that you didn't intend. So, you know, it's not just magic. You can't just, you know, put whoa, 10 different values and whack them all in. You know, you could actually get an issue with resonances between caps. So it's a potential pitfall. Just watch out for it. In this case, it's not particularly bad, but look, just the 10 microfarads on its own would technically be better in this particular case. Now here's a better response if we actually combine four caps, a 10 mic, a 1 mic, a 100N and a 10M, once again all SMD uh, ceramics in various uh, size cases. And you can see that that 8 megahertz peak has gone away, it's you know it's still, it, well we can argue that this is a bit better than the original uh, 10 microfarads just on its own. but. Yeah, it's hard to see this because the higher frequency ones really need a higher frequency response test system, which we don't have here. And here's my four ceramics in parallel here, 10 microfarads, 1 microfarad, 100N and 10N, various different package sizes, and the package sizes are going to make a big difference uh, in terms of the ESR and the uh, impedance response of the individual capacitor. It's not just the capacitance value. Package plays a big part. So I couldn't really get lots of uh, visually good results with the, just the um, SMD ceramic uh, capacitors. They're just 
too good. So I got like a really poor um, axial, uh, sorry, radial leaded 47 microfarad electrolytic uh, capacitor and put that in parallel with a uh, 10 nanofarad ceramic on there. And you can see that, uh, you know, peak around, uh, you know, 15, 16 megahertz or uh, something like that. But the extra 10 nanofarad ceramic brings the impedance of that way back down again at the higher frequencies, uh, which is desirable, of course. And that little tail back end up after 40 megahertz is just due to the test system as we saw uh, right back at the start but the 10 uh, nanofarads would allow um, much better high frequency performance into the hundreds of megahertz and things like that that the 47 microfarad electrolytic on its own it'd just keep going up and up and up and it'd be hundreds of ohms at that free it'd just be way off the scale at that frequency and you may as well not have it at all so that's a reasonable um, example visual example of how combining those two uh, caps actually can, you know, get a reasonably smooth response over a very broad range from 100 kilohertz right up to, you know, maybe a few hundred megahertz or something like that, but we can't see it. But yeah, it would be quite you know, decent performance over that big entire range. So you use the 47 micro for decoupling big, heavy current bursts and the 10 nanofarad for all the high frequency switching. Now here's a little interesting aside. You may have seen weird looking uh, surface mount caps like this in a wide package like this. Well, why? You know, you, you may not have uh, thought anything of it. Well, these are actually special low inductive uh, capacitors designed specifically for this application. Now, if we have a look at um, this little snippet from an AVX um, app note on these low inductance or the evolution of uh, ceramic uh, capacitors here, you can see that, say, a uh, 1206, your standard 1206 one, has about 1200 picohenries or thereabouts of inductance, right? But if you take that exact same size chip, the 1206, and you put the caps on the sides, the uh, conductive caps on the sides instead of the ends, same size cap, but 170 puff. And if we have a look at this TDK data sheet for their uh, C series, their specific low ESL equivalent series inductance that we've been talking about, they're called reverse geometry. And they just put the conductive end, uh, end caps actually on the side of the capacitor instead of on the ends. And it makes the world of difference. And if you're designing, you know, high frequency switch mode power supply or something, you might see, you know, real performance critical uh, stuff where the, um, you know, uh, the bypassing is really going to matter then you might typically find these low ESL caps in there. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that uh, rather lengthy look at how bypass capacitors work and why you put multiple values and types in parallel. There's some real good reasons for it. And uh, sorry, I couldn't really, you know, comprehensively show this. This test setup is pretty crude. It's not the best thing. You really need, you know, a really high frequency, high performance uh, system and carefully laid out uh, test setup and everything else. But hey, you know, just with this, we were able to see. So it did actually take quite a lot of mucking around and trial and error just trying different caps and different sizes and packages and values and things like that just to try and get a response and I probably you know ultimately could get a more uh, realistic example of what I showed on the whiteboard there but I hope you get I hope that was good enough and you really get an idea of how it can uh, really make a difference especially at really high frequencies you can imagine just you know extrapolate those graphs right out and assume we've got a perfect uh, test system and can make one heck of a difference. Anyway, if you like the video, please give it a big thumbs up and all that sort of jazz. You know where to discuss it and links down below for data sheets and other app notes and things. Catch you next time.